This is Roman with Roman Skin and Training. I have Jess next to me. She is, introduce yourself a little bit. Um, my name is Jessica. I've got two of my dogs behind me. I don't know where the other two are. Um, I'm a dog trainer, not, not full-time. And mm -hmm. uh, I love dogs. They are my passion. I love everything about them. They're the best. So, and today our program will be about getting our hyper dog to relax. So, um, you know, owners, most of the owners have active dogs, more or less active. Some are active in the morning, some are active in the afternoon, some are hyperactive. So um, the question is, do we have hyperactive dogs? Okay. Do this condition like ADD at dogs exist? Um, do we have a dog that basically is not helpful by using classical conditioning? Um, what are the parts that trigger a dog to be hyper and how can we address them? So I, I wrote a few things together. So um, I believe there is such thing as hyper activity disorder and um, hyperkinesis disorder and they're rare conditioning but they are so we want we want to include that if we train with a dog who is very active we want to eliminate that options at the first place make sure the dog doesn't have that condition because torturing the dog towards the training session doesn't help the dog at all the frustration from the owner sees you're failing as a trainer and then finally he gives up and maybe surrenders the dog we want we don't want that so how do I recognize this kind of conditions? First of all, increase um, resting heart and respiratory rates. So a vet will give you a better picture on that. Uh, failure to adjust to common stimulus like everyday household noises and activities. Dog gets hyper by every time you open the door. He freaks out every time the air conditioning kicks in or he starts frantic barking and getting crazy when your phone is ringing. <laughs> and then um, agitation or reactivity in general of getting overwhelmed with conditions that are walking people out of the house. Uh, the mailman comes to your door and the dog freaks out, never gets calmer. Um, sustained emotional arousal and in in inability to settle down for a very long period of time. Um, and then paradoxical calming response to amphetamines. So once you, your doctor prescribes that kind of a vitamins and you see, you know, a decline, then obviously that will be a case. So you had already a question. Um, how do you feel about medicating a hyper dog while working on a behavior modification? We will, we will get to that. So um, the other part that's very important is we should recognize the breed. Is this a breed that's hyperactive, like a golden or, you know, a Labrador? Or I have listed a few of those here, like Irish Setter, Alaska Malamute, Jack Russell. Well, okay. American Foxhound, Low Chan, Basset Hound, Manchester Terrier, Beagle, Old English Sheepdog, Border Collie, Otter Hound, Border Collie, Pekingese, Boston Terrier, blah, blah, blah. Saluki, Dachshund, Scottish Terriers, Deerhound, Sheephound, English Foxhound. Siberian Husky, who else have I here? Uh, Weird Heart Pointer, Golden Retriever, Whippet, Greyhounds, all these dogs <clears throat> that basically are bred to be hyper because we need that drive. Imagine you have a Greyhound who's like, hi, and he sees a rabbit and is like, wow. No, it doesn't work. And imagine <clears throat> you have a hunting dog and you need the dog to hunt and there is no drive to activate the dog to chase it. Okay. So, um, dog motel asking if there's an Akita. Well, Akita not really is more a quiet dog. He's a, he's a herding and protection dog. I would not give him that, but some of them can be. So we want to very make sure that our dog is not one of these characteristic dogs who are hyperactive. And you can see that the tendency of some dogs not being calmer before four years of age. So if you get like an English um, Labrador and 
he is a mess until he's four years old and he will not come down. And I wonder how people having like dogs in therapy, they're really calm dogs. They're not the average Labradors, okay? And you know that. Mm -hmm. Then the other problem is bad breeding characteristics. Uh, dogs who come from uh, breeding kennels or um, puppy mills do show excessive stress and except for hyper behavior to the point that even medication would just shut the dog down, but you don't get control over the situation because it's really bad DNA. Um, so do you have something to add on that? Um, you need to add plot hounds to your list of hyper dogs. Yes. Um, but yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I um, I agree completely with everything that you're saying, having been the owner of a, an excessively hyper dog for eight and a half years now. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so what do we do with these things? So if you have that kind of breed, don't give up. You have to adjust your training method as a trainer, as an owner to the breed. You have to satisfy the drive first before you start training. So for some dogs, you need the dog to be run out. For the Saluki, you know, the, the hunting dogs or your high-speed hunting dogs, just let them run for five minutes and they're coming down and then you can do work. And then you have hunting dogs, go outside, do a little bit of a fetch, calm them down and then start doing your training session. So you need, let me, let me check here with you. What did they just do? I did something. What'd you do? I have no idea. So, oh. and uh, what, what? Doug Motel. Oh, yeah, exactly. I think the trick is not just getting exercise, but getting the right exercise for the individual dog. Correct. And it, it, the breed specific exercise. Yes. Yeah. So, for this one behind me, she could run 10 miles and you know, she'd be panting and everything, but she was still up and ready to go. She could have run 10 more. So I needed to find something that worked for her that tired her out. And in the beginning, that was jumping. She loved to jump. And as she got older and couldn't mm -hmm. jump as much, that was the flirt pole that combined the mental and the physical exercise. She'd be lying on the ground panting in 10 minutes. So it's the right type of exercise for the individual dog. So here is a trick that I saw with, with dogs that have worked in the past. So hunting breeds <clears throat> may have a trigger that sits at the neck. Let me bring here my, my happy dog. <clears throat> Voila, my happy dog. He's always happy. He does never complain. So I think most of the hunting breeds have a trigger that's attached here on the neck. And if that doesn't work out, then a dog is not exercise. So for the racing hounds are the legs and if he doesn't get to that speed and to that um, activation of his back hind, back legs, he would not be tired. And if a hunting dog doesn't get exercise his neck and this is where shaking comes in, right? Then that doesn't work out. So just walking for a hunting dog is not enough because he can do that for days and days. That's why he's a hunting dog because he can hunt for days without stopping. Okay. If you want to exercise an Akita, it's different. And if you want to exercise a Husky, Husky going for a dog walk. Okay. He's just warmed up after 10 miles and then whatever. So you have to give a, um, attractive stimulus to exercise the dog, have the dog pulling, give him a job according to his breed. How about dachshunds? What, let them dig. <laughs> yeah. Let them dig and find the hole. <laughs> yep. Um, so, um, what else do we have so here? Can I, I, can I, I ask a list. question? So with yep. hunting dogs, with the trigger in their neck, is that the same for both sight hounds and scent hounds? Or would it differ based on 
the particular type of hunting that they're for. And then, you know, you've got bird dogs or bear dogs. Well, you, you have to see the training methods, how these trainers train the dogs to get to that level and, and satisfy that need. So if you have a scent hound, the best thing to exercise is taking cups yep. and spread them all over the house and, and have him scent exercise. Do this like three times a day and he's done for the week. And then for, for sight hounds, um, I love having, you know, a long um, horse training whip and I have them running right and left by attaching on the rope something like a small stuffed toy and I just threw it over to the other direction. So if you have a, a good whip, it's like three feet, uh, sorry, six or seven feet long, and then you have a rope attached mm -hmm. and then you whip it on the air direction. You give the dog like 50 feet to run, like in a millisecond. Yes. And they love it. Um, I, I want to address one thing. Please be, be careful, especially on, on racing, horse, um, racing dogs. Don't let them cut corners. These are straight running dogs. They don't like to cut corners. So if you have a short yard, make sure you work diagonal and not in circles because they may hurt themselves. Um, yeah, so for terriers, rat terriers, um, pit bulls, um, Staffordshires, the neck is very important because their main work is the neck. The way they, they were bred to function is going to the bulls and, you know, bite them and work with the legs and, and avoid an avoidance training. So playing soccer with your pit is a, is a perfect exercise. Just make sure he doesn't bite the ball. And, and on the other hand, having a, ro a rope toy and do tug of war and always controlled. And we, we will have a, uh, a special feature on that uh, another time, how to work on release of a tug toy. It's very important. You can do super awesome exercise and have, especially people who work at, at the rescues and in the shelters, dogs who are super stressed in the shelter with this tug of war exercise could keep him calm for three, for three days in a row. So one hour exercise keeps the dog for three days quiet. And then on the other two days, you just give him a walk. Um, anything to add on that? Um, no, I don't think so. Not yet. Good. So the next thing that I want to address is nutrition, fa nutritional factor. We see usually dogs that come from rescues or from shelters, they have this donated cheap food and it's like crap. It's like, sue me, bring me to prison. This, this food should not be in the market. Yep. The ingredients are criminal. It's selling people garbage of food processing industry that should not be allowed in the market. There is no controlling factor there. The only thing that's controlled is how much money they pay in taxes, and that's it. Um, just the ingredients, the burnt fats, uh, the bad carbs, um, meat meals, Shelter kills, road yeah. kills, uh, slaughter kills. They, they are dumped on a pile of meat for weeks. It's, it's unbelievable what goes in the dog food. And the Department of Agriculture officially said, well, dogs are meat too. And they are not denying that dog food can contain dog meat. And cats can eat cat food made out of cats because there's nothing there that restrains them not to do it. Okay, yes, it's gross, but unfortunately this is what it is. And especially that kind of meat is called meat. There's no definition on that, just plain meat. Um, the same thing goes for vitamins and the supplements that go in the dog food. Imagine that tri-gibble that you can buy in the market is so high temperature cooked that no vitamin will survive. So they put these synthetic vitamins in it. They will synthetically survive the cooking process and still be traceable just in case they get an audit. That's what it is, nothing else. Yeah. And a small trick, what is in the bag 
is not what it is in the ingredient list. They are not forced to say everything that's in the ingredient list. Okay, they made a big deal out of it. They can have most of it, but not everything. So you don't really know what's in it. Yeah, roadkill. And that's why you have find on, on wet food trace of tick flea preventative in the dog food. Like how did this came in there? It's because they dumped the dogs with the flea collar. <laughs> so simple as that. Or, you know, they have this oily stuff. They, yeah, I don't want you to talk about that. So I know that because I worked in that industry. I was in a food processing department. I know what the garbage is, okay? And if they tell you about uh, sweet potato and carrots and, you know, barley and all this fancy stuff, it's, on, it's not what you find in the supermarket. It's like leftovers from these processing and filter units and extruders. Yeah. Yeah, make... And one thing is important because people get confused and, and we, we pushing them in the wrong direction by saying just commercial dog food is bad. Home cooked food is not healthy either if you don't comply to the dog's nutritional needs because you buy him healthy chicken doesn't mean that chicken is good for your dog all day long. And because you add rice to it because it's healthy doesn't mean that dog can live with dog with rice and chicken. So you need to comply to the dog's natural needs and vitamins and having the proper um, proper grains in it and no carbs. And now I will post later, I have a, a link that I can give you guys where I have all these weird stuff that you should watch on your dog food on one particular list so you can print it out. Yeah. So the next thing that I want to mention <clears throat> and my voice is going down is um, besides the diet water a, a dog who doesn't have enough body water gets stressed so I would say food and water is 30% of a dog's stress right away in the beginning lack of body water creates friction and lack of body water creates the brain not e able to think through a process and the dog gets stressed because he cannot think and we know what happens if we are dehydrated we are not, unable to find water so if you want to go to healthy food um, i would suggest to get books that are dedicated to raw diet or cooked food they are studied they are educated book education books read them through don't make shortcuts. It's not healthy for your dog. Having kidney failure or liver failure is easier than you think. So the next thing that I want um, to address here is also the temperament makes a huge um, impact on the dog's stress excitement. So, and saying that, having that exercise, not only through the nutrition, but also from the body workout is important. Uh, especially working dogs. Oh, he's cute. Oh, this is Morgan. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a pharaoh dog. He's a uh, not. Uh, he's an intermediate Shalowitz Quintley. Okay, I I, sh I just saw a bug. I just saw a little bit of skin. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, here lost track. So we talked about the dietary. We we're um, talking about at the exercise. Good. So temperament and exercise, I think these two things go together, but I want to focus again a little bit on the exercise part. <clears throat> you have to do the exercise also according to your dog's environment. So even if your dog is a mastiff and hangs out all day long doing nothing in the bed, doesn't mean he does need exercise. Um, dog's body system reacts with walking and the paws are connected with internal circuits that activates the body to function. So a dog that lays down doesn't mean he's just lazy, he's just not activated. And we see also dogs suffering, suffering of going uh, into the bathroom because they are not activated. So exercise is a very important thing to do, not only for the exercise part, but also for the emotional connection with the owner. 
So dog exercise is not only healthy for the dog, but it's also healthy for the relationship, which creates friction and in extension creates stress too. So for example, imagine you're a visitor in a house and nobody talks to you and nobody interacts with you. How do you feel? That creates stress. And the dog that doesn't have a job in the house, that creates stress. And if he doesn't have communication skills with his owner, that creates stress. And all of a sudden we have stressed dogs, we have a stressed owner, and then we have dog fights, and we have disputes in the family, which creates again stress. And all of a sudden you are this in this in this holy circle and you cannot get out. So very important symptoms that the dog is not well exercised are, for example, barking or whining for attention. He tells you, uh, uh, do something with me, do something with me. You have to, you have to do, basically do something. Uh, excessive mouthing and play biting. A dog wants interaction. The only thing to express it is with his mouth because he cannot express it anyway. Uh, predatory and rough play, very important with people who have two dogs or more in their yard. The dogs aggravate each other. They want to exercise each other. So they become prey and predator. And then they get in a dog fight. And then what we do is we stop them because we don't want them to have a rough fight. But basically, we deny them the access to exercise. So a good indication that dogs need extra exercise one-on-one -on -one is when they start fighting with each other and it just become prey and predator interaction. Destructive chewing. <clears throat> Um, digging and scratching, counter surfing, garbage trading, and sneaky types behavior like going under the bed, you have to chase him to put the leash on, um, um, crashing into furniture, bouncing off, um, how you call this, like checking in with other dogs, like try to create a, a trigger to the other dog to do something so he can release his stress. And some suggestion to exercise your dog. I think um, inspire, inspire your high energy dog to physical and mental interaction like just Jess said before. You have to find the right amount of energy grounding work that your dog can handle. You cannot overstress your dog at this point. You have to physically exercise him and mentally stimulate your dog. For example, you just walk, walk 10 steps and stop. Wait until he sits. He sits, he checks in with you, you continue 10 steps and you stop. That way the dog is like synchronizing with you and you will feel in his ears they start gleaming out of heat because they have to cool the brain down of his all thinking. What is my partner doing? Why is he stopping? What is he doing? Oh, I have to check in. And all of a sudden he's so busy with his owner that, that calms him down and you see a calm, nice walking dog. Um, now I need, your, I need to answer your question that you asked before, how about medicating your dog? I would say yes, but <clears throat> there are medication who do different things. And I, I want you to consult um, a holistic veterinarian and not just a veterinarian who just prescribed diet, um, that just prescribed medication, because different medications have different effect on the emotional state. Yes. And you need a dog who is emotional stable. So some medication who are downers have side effects that you don't want. For example, a blurry vision. A dog would not tell the vet that, hey, dude, I have no clue who you are. And that stressed and makes a dog reactive. He is calm, but he's fearful and aggressive. You don't want that either. So you want to discuss the side effects. And unfortunately, they are not recording the side effects on dog medication. They are only needed to do with three or four dogs or seven dogs, if I remember right. A study with seven dogs is enough to, to approve a medication, which is completely nonsense. So we can see side effects in children because dogs emotional state is similar to children up to age of 12. And so if you compare child medication and use that reference, you can pretty much predict what will happen with your dog. I'm not a veterinarian. That's my personal experience. I just want to make it sure. 
Uh, take your dog for a walk and a hike. Just don't make it an hour. Just take your car and drive somewhere different. Go in an open field, get a 50-foot leash and just let him roam. Just don't let go. Um, play and fetch. It's an interesting toy, but I would be very careful that you don't fetch your dog crazy <laughs> because that could have the opposite effect. Too long fetching gets the dog into this automatic reaction and he becomes addictive to fetching and basically you hit exactly the wrong direction. Do we have any questions so far? So, and I'll say, um, touching on the medication, Maple, um, she she's still hyper. She's eight now, so it's not um, mm -hmm. it's not as bad as it used to be. But she was also aggressive and fearful and mm -hmm. hyper. You know, just everything bundled into one. I tried every medication out there. And something that they don't tell you, and in fact, my own vet did not even know this, a side effect of a lot of these medications is more aggression because it lowers inhibitions. So you really mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. to work with a vet who knows their stuff, try to find a veterinary behaviorist who can work with your local vet. But, you mm -hmm. know, and, and medication can help most dogs don't need medication forever. They just need it for that period when you're working on behavior and you're working on exercises. Um, but yeah, you really need to work with a vet and a vet behaviorist and somebody who really knows what these medications do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is correct. So one thing I want to add to the medication, what I usually use is a lot of herbals. Um, one very good thing to use is, let me see if I can show that. Rescue remedy, yes, okay. good stuff. Rescue remedies, um, I like the ingredients, I see the reaction, it has an effect, but one important thing, with this medication, it's so only supportive medication, it will not calm your dog down to the point that your dog will sleep all day, unless you kind of pass him out. Um, so, we have an excitement dog. What's up, buddy? And I, I also outside? use Composure, which is a calming supplement. Um, mm -hmm. Use it. Keep talking. I have to switch your dog. Use it according to instructions. So I got for the medium-sized dog, and on the back of the bag, you know, it says you can give two of these Composure treats per 55 pounds of dog, and Maple weighs 55 pounds. So I thought, great, I'm going to give her two. And... That poor dog was stoned. I mean, her pupils were huge, and she was, like, bopping her head on the wall, and I thought I was going to kill my dog. But it just turns out oh my God. if you try the composure treat, start with one and see how your dog does. Uh -huh. And make sure you're at home when you do it so my dogs are all fine with it. A friend of mine tried it, and her dog's got explosive diarrhea. So... Anytime oh. you're using herbals or medication, the first time or two you give it to your dog, make sure you are home with them in case there's an adverse reaction. Mm -hmm. But I will say composure and rescue remedy do work very, very well for my dogs. One thing I need to add here, and I totally agree with you, is unfortunately the medication rule goes by body weight. But this medication are emotionally. Yeah. So theoretically, we should not go out of body weight. We should go about emotional capacity. So a German Shepherd having 70 pounds will react different than a Great Dane 70 pounds or a Golden 70 pounds. And that's why the knowledge over the breed comes in fact, where people have to have knowledge that a dog who is only a plain working dog will react different from a dog who's a protection dog or a working dog. So we have to watch that. That have the same effect if the dog is going into narcosis for a surgery. That's a factor that we should know and study and, and join, join Facebook groups, breed specific Facebook groups that have that knowledge. And every Facebook group is a huge information center there to ask. You have a Mastiff, ask a Mastiff lovers group. If you have a German Shepherd, contact the German Shepherd group. 
and not only one, just spread the word out there. Uh, if you have a Great Dane, join the Great Dane group. Why not? It's not a bad thing to ask a question and get a feedback. And some veterinarians have no clue about your breed. Just because you're a dog lover doesn't mean your veterinarian has to know about it because he has to like 250 different breeds to know like out of his mind, really. Even if I go in training session and I go to a breed that I'm not very comfortable with in the beginning, I have to kind of refresh myself like uh, plot. Yeah, plot mix. What is he mixed into? Ah, okay, hunting dog. Okay. He's down south. Okay, good. I got it. And now I'm going for work. Yep. So important, try the medication, see, go to the minimum amount prescribed and increase as you see. Um, easy herbals like um, valerian or chamomile are coming. So what I do, for example, I, I use chamomile organic chamomile tea and I take these biscuits like like normal juice biscuit and I just put them in in that tea soak them in and give my dog to eat they have so much flavor the biscuits they override the, the chamomile and then the other thing that also Martina mentioned and I really love are crystals for example crystals have so much effect and impact and dogs are so sensitive to the crystals that if you don't know what to do I would suggest get a book here. One of my favorite books is Crystal Remedies or Crystal Healing for, for Animals. And it's basically everything that somebody needs to know, kind of get a better picture about how to use crystals in everyday even dog training um, to get a better bond, to calm the dog down, to get rid of trauma. These are things that somebody has. Uh, what behaviors do you train? So is the question answered? The first um, question about the medication? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Next, you have another question. Guys, by the way, you can ask questions, right? What behaviors do you train to help a hyper dog calm himself down? Yes, um, that picture here, I'll show it to you. <laughs> can you see that? Yep. Okay, I, I, move, I move over here. I've kind of tried to prepare myself. Yep. Visible? Yep, I can see that. Yes, I think it's visible. Yep. So the, the first thing, what happens here with a dog who gets super hyper, they overshoot the excitement. And excitement here is number nine and here is zero. And that will be five for those who knows my, my excitement level um, picture is the dog from zero to nine in a very short amount of time. And then what you, what I use as an exercise is basically aggravate the dog to a certain level and then absolutely stand still and wait the dog to calm down. And then I aggravate him again and then I calm down. So dogs from the energy perspective that try to save energy. And what he does is he says, why should I get all the way excited if I have to go all the way down? So you have an adjustment curve and maybe in a week or two, you get to that level that the dog will not react to the same action that way he reacted before. Okay, yep. so that's a similar exercise that I use. I love to work, especially with rescue dogs and dogs who come from a shelter to this super peak and super low exercise. In anything that triggers him. He likes to get stressed on the walk, make five step and stop. He has to come all the way down. And he was like going between level and you will have a little bit of, you know, excitement, but not as, as it was in the beginning. Good. Um, I will, if somebody wants to take a screenshot, let me put it here. Yep. Where, where am I? Yep, over here, here we go. So, and one of the things I do also is mm -hmm. I use the, I use place as a safe space for yes. dogs where they can calm down. Correct. So, and I'll use my four as an example, and I'm just very happy they're all getting older and slower. Mm -hmm. um, 
collectively they're called the tornado. And when they start getting out of control because they all do have behavioral issues that could escalate into a fight, we use place. So when they get really, really hyper and I need them to calm down in a hurry, they know that place is their safe place. I compare it to like the Correct. day spa, you know, we go to the spa to get away and right. relax and that's what place is for them also. So if I'm not in a position to use that kind of, you know, that exercise that you were just explaining, they know we go on place and we all chill out now. Good. Uh, that's a very inter interesting to have a dog learn his upper limit. And when he reaches his upper limit, then he automatically goes to place. And it's, it's about the trainer's position, how precise he recognized the signal of that level of excitement. For example, the moment you see that one dog is going after the other dog's feet, for example, a border collie will do that. Then the moment you see he's going after the feet, hey, guys, come back. Let's go to bed. Oh, it's just that playing. Yeah, I know. Let's go to bed. Have them chill out for 20 minutes and they get through them back in the ring. Now he knows when he touches the back leg, he's going to bed. And guess what? He doesn't try to go after the back leg. And the other option is you have a pit, pits playing with each other. They're mouthing each other is fine. As the moment you see the pit going after the neck, eh, time out. Yep. No, no exception. Not another guess. Well, if you don't watch it, it will escalate. So if you have playtime and you have a dog who's hyper, you better be a part of the game and watch them. Yeah, and you got to catch it like that. You have to be quick. Yeah. Catch it. Timing, timing, position. For example, you have a Mastiff, and what they do is they get verbal. If you get verbal, uh, time out. Ken Corso starts barking, uh, time out. A Beagle, he barks anyway. <laughs> but, you know, you have that level. A Beagle are easy to, to get hyper because that's what they're bred for. They kind of move barking. Okay, that's something. You have. I don't know about beagles. I just avoid them. <laughs> I have to admit, I don't know about beagles. I love beagles. I think they're great. They definitely. Yeah, need, I, I love them. They they need special owners who can that's, deal with the barking and the howling. Exactly, and they need like five hundred beagles as friends. Yeah. So they can all bark together. Does anybody have any question? Martina has a question. Um, so the answer to your question is is done, right? Yes. Jess, about yes. training hyper. Come, okay. So could it be that you have to connect with the dog? So hyper well, yes. Um, that's a very good question, Martina. From my experience, that's number one on my bucket list when I meet a dog. The first is communication. Communication gives the dog a peace of mind that they're not alone and it takes away a stress. Communication skills um, and reading skills is very important in the beginning because if you don't know your dog's behavior and you don't know your dog's patterns, how can you help him? Where is the signal where your dog starts getting stressed? Yeah, Martina had that experience today. And that's why she was the question. She asked the question. Uh, so it's very important to learn the signals of your dog. My personal signals, my favorite signals, is lip licking. This is the first thing that the dog will show if the input information is higher than the processing capacity. The first signal. And when you see that, especially on fearful dogs, that's a signal that you have to calm down, take him out of the problem. The next signal is lifting legs. He's getting into stress situation. He sends a calming signals. He lifts one leg or both legs, right? Which is part of the excitement. But I want to make a separation between fear and excitement because fear look, looks similar. Lifting one leg, I want to get away from here, but I can't because I'm frozen. My back legs wouldn't do what I want and start moving because I'm so excited. I don't know what to do with it. Um, these are two different directions. So we need to watch that. I think a fearful dog gets fear excited and that makes him dangerous. A confident dog will get excited and he's not as dangerous. He's more predictable. 
Okay, so that goes to you, Martina. You have dogs who get excited based on fear, and that's a trigger because it goes into the prey drive and protection drive. So it's a wrong wrong expression, protection drive. It doesn't it doesn't exist. But it goes to drive to protect himself and fear drive, and you don't want the dog there. It's an unnatural direction. So it's that kind of self-preservation kicks in. Is that what you mean? Correct, correct. Yeah. It's a reflex that kicks in. The dog has no yeah. control over it. Yeah, we are not allowed to get excited in this house because there will 100% be a lethal dog fight. So excitement is not mm -hmm. allowed. This one and that one can play together. And that's it. Everybody mm -hmm. else has to play by mm -hmm. themselves. It, it's very strict I with say that excitement. Most of you guys, um, and you see this all the time on Facebook, and most of people who are here come from that direction. Um, when people say, well, my dog and the dog fight, okay, in the house. Why are they playing in the house? A house is a church, is a quiet place, is a place where there is no excitement. If he can play in the house rough, he can jump on people. If he can jump on people, he can bite them. Okay, so if you don't have that option in the house, if you remove that right to jump and be excited in the house, you basically control the whole household. You can be outside excited under supervision, but you know, it's like a loaded gun. You don't play around with guns. You try to have them disarmed as much as possible and use them and load them when you need them and unload them if you don't need them. So does anybody have another question here? Oh, I'll, I'll answer um, KFR Fitz's question. I always have my same four dogs in the house now because she is very dog aggressive outside of our group. Um, I used to mm -hmm. foster and I would have anywhere from five to eight dogs in the house. But when Maple turned mm -hmm. two, her aggression became unmanageable. So I do not bring any other dogs, any other animals into the house anymore. Mm -hmm. so I see. Some dogs, I think, um, just can't handle that revolving door. Mm -hmm. Very right. Did I lose you? Who, me? No, sorry, I was reading Martina's yeah. question. OK. So how about reinforcing by accident excessive behaviors like attention seeking reward? Well, the, the easiest thing to falsely reinforce is jumping. It's so easy because the first thing we do, the dog jumps and we push him away and you just reward it. First of all, he touches you, he's a reward. Then you push him away, you just trigger him to do more out of it. So when we have a bad behavior, Sometimes we are, we are as owners are not capable to see the underlying structure of that behavior. We have to consult a professional who is able to analyze that behavior in small pieces and work one piece at a time until that behavior is eliminated. Because jumping on you or jumping on people cannot be fixed if you allow him to jump on you because you love when he's on you. And sending the dogs uh, mixed messages doesn't help him at all. So you have to be structured and really follow through instructions that your trainer gives you, even if you don't like them, but sometimes they're really helpful. Yep, I actually accidentally reinforced this guy's jumping up because when he was a puppy, he was so cute. And I came home and you know he jumped up and I gave him a hug. Well, turned out to be a Great Dane mix and I'm not even five feet uh -huh. tall. So, you know, he would jump up uh -huh. and knock me over. So. He has to do something when you get home because he's mixed with lab. He needs to do something. So he will now run and get a toy instead of just knocking me over. But, you know, I, oh, I reinforce that jumping because he was a cute little puppy. And when they're little, they're not going to knock you over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. So I want to share... Um, the dog food thing that I had today. I have to share different stuff. So 
Okay, here's the dog food that I want to share with you guys. And at the end of that link, when you open that picture, you will find a link at the very bottom and you can subscribe to that so you can get more of those. It takes a little bit while until I get access to my... <clears throat> And I, I think for me, and Roman, I'm interested to know what you think. Um, I think for me, mm -hmm. exercise and nutrition are kind of tied for first place in the best tools in your toolbox for working with a hyper dog. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, nu nutrition is so incredibly important. This one here, when I switched her off of chicken and duck, basically anything with feathers, within a matter of days, mm -hmm. it was like I had a different dog. She had just calmed down so much. I, it, it was amazing. I mean, nutrition is just incredible. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, my, my top list is communication. Yeah. Body language and is, is that? Yeah. And then first communicate as, as it comes in, the first thing you communicate with your dog, then stabilize nutrition, then do the exercise. Because the first thing you have to do is you, you have to detox your dog. Yep. So I, I just tried to set a link here. Oh my God, it worked. Yes, it did. Yes. Awesome. So you can guys click on it and kind of scan it. You want to tell me if it works? Oh, it's telling me how to make an infographic. Let me try again. Oh, really? Let's... No, click on the picture. Yeah, I did. Let me see. Ah, here we go. Now it's back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. I mean, there's dog food is um, very difficult to navigate. Yep. So I have more of this stuff. On the very bottom, you will find the link that says click to get more doc infographics. So I'll try to have every month at least two of those as we do the webinars. Uh, so they go together. And they're just kind of cheat sheets. One that is pending and I promise to do that is about cooling and heating foods which I think should I mention um, is an important part to feed your dog proper nutrition, not, not only food, but also based on the energetics of dog food. For example, a dog who's barking a lot, I would consider a hot dog and a dog that's hot would typically demonstrate it through a variety of signs. Um, he would see cool places. He would dig himself in the ground. Uh, he, you will feel him very hot. He will pant a lot. Um, a hot may have red eyes or red skin, or you will see him restless. Dogs that are affected by allergies and a very high arousal are characteristic in having a hot nature. So this kind of dogs, I would definitely switch immediately to cooling foods. And what are cooling foods on the yin yang? Um, tonic, cooling foods, for example, is, um, give me a second. I have to, I have to find my cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. <clears throat> okay. There it is. I miss a page, however. Good, so you don't want to feed if you have a hot dog. You can feed beef, beef liver, goose, pork, pork liver, pork feet, pork kidneys, tripe and quail. You should not feed meat as lamb, sheep or venison, okay? So you can, a neutral food, for example, for a hot dog would be okay 
uh, carp, catfish, herring, mackerel, salmon, sardines, and tuna as vegetables, which I don't like soya beans, but you can give them if you get a organic, which are not existing anyway. Uh, you can give beans, cauliflower, green beans, um, string beans, pumpkin, potato, yams, um, grains, well, as less as possible, white rice would be okay and lentils would be okay. I would not feed corn because corn is basically yeah. like not healthy for dogs at this point. Um, so, yeah, that's a few things that I wanted to mention. for today. Um, does anybody have any questions in addition? I don't. Any questions? Oh, um, KFR Fit asks, what about trout? And that, so that sounds like a Canadian fish, right? Ha 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 ha. And uh, Rebecca mentioned barley. <laughs> Yeah, so trout is a hot food, and I would not give my dog, especially mastiffs, I would not give a trout. But it's tasty, I love it, but I would not give it to dogs. And it's not a fish you should give a dog. I mean, it's expensive. <laughs> they deserve it. <laughs> what else? I know, yeah. you can share it. Um, what about barley? Uh, barley is a herb, it's, um, right? it's, it's a grain, I think. Is that, um, I, yeah. oh, 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 barley. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Um, barley, let me cheat, cheat, check. So, and I know, um, my dog who is allergic to everything but fish, barley is supposed to be one of those healthy mm -hmm. grains. Um, that's supposed to be okay to eat, but mm -hmm. I know for my allergic dog, he can't even have any kind of grain, no barley. If I remember barley is a hot food, I need, I need to confirm it first. No, garlic is a, is a, <clears throat> um, is a yin tonic, like it's, it's an average food, a cooling food, cooling to average food. So rice, millet, barley, white, white germ, wheat, rice, and quinoa. But be careful, some dogs are allergic to Oh, really? To quinoa. Um, yeah. Um, and be careful the carbs. Really, carbs are not healthy for dogs. Dogs can live on zero carbs. Yeah. Um, vegetables, beets. Beets is full of sugar, and I would not give my dog beets. You can see that also in this Dr. Harvey's dry food. There's so much beet in it, you don't need that. It's not necessary. It's too much sugar. It's a cheap filler, though, because it's cheap for the market. So natural foods, again, meat is beef, beef liver, goose, pork, pork liver, pork feet, pork kidneys, tripe, and guile. Fish, carp, catfish, herring, mackerel, salmon, sardines, sturgeon, and tuna. Vegetables black soybeans, I don't like them really, kidney beans, uh, no beets, uh, broad beans, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower. Cauliflower I would cook a little bit, just steam it. Um, pumpkin is okay, potato is okay, but still too much starch. I would not give my dog too much potato. What about fruits? Um, Are there fruits that you can give? Fruit. Um, fruits contain a lot of sugar, so yeah, you can give some apples, you can give some fruits that have high uh, vitamin contents like bananas. They are sweet too, but they are acceptable because they have so much stuff in it. Um, what else do we have here? I think milk products are okay, like cheese and milk. I, use, I like probiotics, milk like kefir and Greek yogurt because A, it's cooling because it's cold and it has so much calcium in it that dogs really need healthy calcium and not cheat rock that most of dog food is in it. Um, eggs are okay. 
goat's milk is okay. Um, yep, I think we covered pretty much blackberries, raspberries, banana, watermelon, apples, lemon would be sour. Yeah, I think that's pretty yeah. much it. Uh, guys, be, please be careful when you copy paste from the internet these cooling and heating foods. They're, basically, they are most of them are copy paste from another website, and these are human foods. Not always okay for dogs and cats, so be careful. Good. Anything else? Oh, one other thing that I want to add for those who have access to Reiki. A hyper dog usually is a not grounded dog. A good thing to do is grounding, grounding, grounding. A dog that barks, throat chakra. A dog who is stressed could be the, the heart and solar plexus. Um, but a Reiki session with your dog will be very helpful. Just because you don't see things happen doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So if you don't trust your Reiki person, don't do Reiki. But if you trust him, let him do his job and trust what he says. Good. So um, that is said. It's 4 o'clock, and I still have a little bit of voice, <laughs> enough to say thank you so much, Jess, for helping. Martina wanted to help, and I kind of put you in the position by accident. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, no, that's fine. Um, it, it 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 was good because you have that experience and it, it helped a lot. Oh, good. And I'm glad. Martina had also her good questions, which helps a lot. Yes. Um, no, no seeds in general. Well, I say garlic. I like garlic. I'm Greek. And from the energy perspective, garlic has a heart regulating situation um, dogs who have parasites garlic will help but i would get organic garlic or processed garlic dry garlic that's processed and doesn't have all this strength and yeah. go slow any supplements you add to your dog's food go slow and increase and you always check on the output uh, moist output or you know very liquid poop it's a signal that too much things going on too too quick of a time. Yeah, the reason that they say no garlic or very limited garlic is because garlic can change the blood cells, the red blood cells. And, you know, like we were talking about <laughs> medications, some dogs are a lot more sensitive than others. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to, you know, see how your dog is I would going. say, correct. I would say check in with the holistic veterinarian who has understanding about terrible treatment, do a blood check. And a good indication is dogs who are very prone to, uh, to parasites, their blood system is not working healthy, meaning is it needs a little bit of adjustments and this garlic. And um, let me see. And also spirulina helps a lot. Oh. So an unhealthy dog is very attractive to parasites because the parasites belong to a law of recycling and they want to fix things faster. So if the dog is in declining, the parasites fall over him and get it done because the immune system is weak. And that's why I say before I start training and stress the dog out through training, I would start with nutrition to balance the nutritional factor, balance the blood level, have the brain cells cleaned out and cleansing so the dog can, per can perform better with less stress. Yep, I take my tea. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining today uh, I think we covered a lot yes. please don't miss to go to my website romanscanandtraining.com and join the tribe because you get all these updates and information I know I promised a lot I had some restructuring going on um, through my um, website support I hope I get up soon and everybody gets his emails back. Limited tomatoes. Yep, I would agree. Limited tomatoes. Fruit seed. Da, 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 da. Okay, we stop recording. And